You all may be seated. Greetings and welcome to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Fair Housing Month 2023 opening ceremony. My name is Dr. Tiffany Tuma. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am proud to serve as your MC. This year commemorates the 55th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, the civil rights landmarks law that prohibits discrimination in housing. Five and a half decades later, it still aids as an effective instrument to ensure fairness and justice in housing. It promises that all people have the right to housing of their choice, regardless of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, disability and familial status. The theme for Fair Housing Month 2023 is Choices for All Voices, Building an Equitable Future. This is an appeal for all to take a stand to eliminate housing discrimination and raise the public understanding of fair housing rights and responsibilities. Next, we will hear from the 18th Secretary of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha L. Fudge. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you. It's uh, good to welcome you to HUD's Fair Housing Month commemoration, and it's really a pleasure to see you in the building. I want to thank everyone who played any role in making this day and this event possible. But I'd especially like to thank our Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Demetria McCain. Demetria, every day you work to prevent and ultimately end housing discrimination, and we are forever grateful for your work. We have some special guests joining us virtually today, including students from Texas Southern University. You might have had something to do with that, Demetri. <laughs> and the mother of fair housing, Ms. Lee Porter. Ms. Porter, your work as a fair housing champion has changed the lives of countless people. Thank you for all you have done and all that you continue to do to ensure that the people of New Jersey have access to the housing of their choice. It has been 55 years since the Fair Housing Act became the law of the land. For five decades, there has been a written guarantee that no matter your race, your color, your national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or disability, you have every right to live where you want to live. At HUD, we work very hard to enforce that law and protect people's right to live free of discrimination. Yet, as Ms. Porter and all of us know too well, we still have a lot of work to do. We want to be sure that we ensure choices for all voices. We have work to do to build an equitable future, a future where a person's rental application is not rejected because they have a housing choice voucher a future where LGBTQI plus people do not feel unsafe being themselves in their own home, and people with disabilities aren't faced with extra fees or denied reasonable accommodations. A future where those who have paid their debt to society and served their time have a fair shot at a second chance and a place to live. That's what we have been working on under this Biden and Harris administration since day one. We have restored the disparate impact rule because we know that if policies have an unjustified discriminatory impact, it doesn't matter what its intent was. We must make sure that it is corrected. We have proposed a rule on AFFH that fulfills the promise of the Fair Housing Act. If you have not already, I encourage you to comment. The deadline has been extended to April 24. We are rooting out discrimination in the home buying process and ending bias in home valuations. Under this administration, we are not just talking the talk. We are walking the walk. We are making things happen. We do this because at our core, 
we know that housing is foundational to everything in a person's life. Everyone in this country has the right to feel safe at home. Home really is where the heart is. It is the place that grounds us. Home should protect us from harm. It should not be a place where harm is perpetuated. So this Fair Housing Month, we are re recommitting to our work to ensure choices for all voices and build an equitable future. Thank you for joining this effort. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary Fudge, for your steadfast leadership and wonderful remarks on HUD's programs and services. Next, we welcome the Texas Southern University's award-winning debate team via a special video presentation. The debate team has been in existence since 1949. Also, these bright young scholars participated in the historic virtual inauguration of President Joseph R. Biden and Vice President Kamala D. Harris under the leadership of Dr. Gloria Baptiste Roberts as director and coach. The debate team will take us back to those pivotal historic moments in Congress and beyond that paved the way for fair housing rights in America. We sent Negroes in large numbers to the real estate office in Gage Park, and every time a Negro went in, the real estate agent said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have anything listed. Now you can find something somewhere else. And it was always back in the ghetto, but they didn't have anything. And then soon after that, we sent some of our fine white staff members into those same real estate offices. And the minute the white person got it, oh yes, we have several things. Now what exactly do you want? January 17th. 1967. H.R. 2516, a bill introduced by Representative Emanuel Seller of New York to prescribe penalties for certain acts of violence and intimidation, and for other purposes. August 16th, 1967. The bill passed the House, 32 to 93, with 12 members voting present or abstaining. February 7, 1968. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 75, H.R. 2516. Mr. President, the amendment we are now discussing is likely to be the most important domestic legislation to come before the Senate this year. Discrimination in the sale and rental of housing has been the root cause of the widespread patterns of de facto segregation which characterize America's residential neighborhoods. It is not true that those patterns, as they have developed in our time, stem primarily from the alleged desires of minorities to cluster together and to avoid integrated neighborhoods. It is fair to say that the prevalent residential patterns may have had their origins in the tendency of migrants to seek out friends and kinsmen when they have first settled in an area. But this tendency, to the extent it was ever a reality, is relevant only to the initial settlement of immigrants in a given area. Over the years, after the newcomers have become established in an area, after they or their children have begun to realize the traditional American opportunities to better their lot by education and hard work, they have always been able to move up if they've desired. We must assure Americans that their efforts to advance themselves and their families are worthwhile, and that a good education, a job consumerate with his demonstration capacity, and a home of his own choosing 
will not be denied him on vicious grounds of racial discrimination. The Senate resumed the consideration of H.R. 2516, the bill to prescribe penalties for certain acts of violence and intimidation and for other purposes. Mr. President, I rise because of the personal mention of me made by our distinguished minority leader. The amended sections of the bill are a great improvement over what was proposed originally. It is with some reluctance that I shall vote for this bill. It is incumbent upon all of us, however, as it is upon me to weigh the pluses and minuses and then vote on the question one way or the other. Mr. President, I yield the floor. I commend our outstanding minority leader, the Senator from Minnesota, the other sponsors of the legislation, and the amendments for their efforts on this legislation. The bill passed in Senate with amendments on March 11, 1968. I have bad news for you. For all our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and killed tonight. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and justice for his fellow human beings. And he died because of that effort. Dear Mr. Speaker, two years ago, I asked the Congress to guarantee a basic American right, the right of a man to secure a home for his family, regardless of the color of his skin. The House of Representatives passed such a law, but it died in the Senate. Last year, I again submitted fair housing legislation. This legislation languished in committee. This year, I once again appealed to the Congress to confirm this fundamental of human dignity. The signs at long last were hopeful. The Senate passed a fair housing law last month on March 11th. I wrote to you, urging you to pass the Senate bill. But since then, this urgent legislation has been blocked by the House. Last night, America was shocked by a senseless act of violence. A man who devoted his life to the nonviolent achievement of rights that most Americans take for granted was killed by an assassin's bullet. This tragedy has caused all good men to look deeply in their hearts. When the nation so urgently needed the a healing balm of unity, a brutal wound on our conscious forces upon us all, this question, what more can I do to achieve brotherhood and equality amongst all Americans? There are so many actions that Congress can take on its part. The most immediate is to enact legislation so long delayed and so close to fulfillment, we should pass the fair housing law when the Congress conveys next week. Mr. Speaker, I urge the members of the House of Representatives to rise to this challenge. In your hands lies the power to renew for all Americans the great promise of opportunity and justice under law. I ask you to bring this bill to a vote in the House of Representatives at the earliest possible moment. This time, for the action is now. Sincerely, President Lyndon B. Johnson. On April 10, 1968, the Senate met at 12 o'clock and was called to order by the President pro tempore. Mr. President, the best news of the past few days is the passage of, by the House of Representatives of the 1968 Civil Rights Bill. This is a fitting response, although an inadequate one, to the tragic death of Dr. King. Even more, it is a demonstration that the democratic process can work. Passage of a national fair housing law will not stop those who are committed to violence in our cities, but it will rob them of Negro support. The psychological importance for Negroes of available decent housing may ease somewhat the frustrations of Negro life, frustrations which are the breeding grounds of civil disorder. Congress has demonstrated to those who persevere to progress through legislative action that it can respond to a need that affects every single American, that the nonviolent means which Martin Luther King advocated do work. The Riot Commission specifically 
recommended enactment of a comprehensive and enforceable federal open housing law. Today's action by the House meets one of the steps called for by the Riot Commission, but one step is not enough. Clearly not enough when racial and violence strikes 110 cities over a weekend. We must turn now to the other recommendations. Before we rest easily, we must be certain that the millions of Negroes in this nation are sharing the opportunity and economic progress that most whites know and enjoy. The House met at 12 o'clock noon, April 10th, 1968. Mr. Speaker, I hope the members will not act in haste today, but will open H.R. 2516, the Civil Rights Bill, for amendments or send it to the conference committee for further study. I urge the members of the House not to act in haste, but to look at the other side of the coin, the private homeowner and the taxpaying American citizens who, if you pass this bill, will be further penalized by this country for being a good citizen. Mr. Speaker, the events of the past four days have taken a terrible toll of human life and property. A man who worked for the peaceful attainment of liberty and equality has been murdered. We can sit and deplore, for whatever reason is most comfortable, the havoc that is shaking this nation. We have done that enough. Or we can stand up and furnish the leadership necessary to end the vicious and deep-rooted causes of racial hatred and fear, causes so recently set out in the report of the President's Commission on Civil Disorders. We can continue to deplore, but have we not had our fill of that? Are we not at long last ready to take up the hard and costly battle for equal justice and to recognize that this is to be no limited war? I urge members of the House of Representatives to take that first step now before any thought is given to an Easter recess by approving the amended bill H.R. 2516. In the long war in Vietnam, I have voted to draft Negro youths to risk their lives in defense of this country. How can I, therefore, now vote against eliminating a discrimination which faces them when they return home? Mr. Speaker, one of the finest statements for supporting the action to concur in the Senate amendments was made by the very gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Anderson, when he said, I have come to this judgment because I believe that as a nation, we must turn our face away from a course of segregation and separation. We must reaffirm this essential human right to justice and human dignity. That statement is based on the truth and principle. It is based on the constitutional right of all persons to equal rights and opportunity and respect. And more so, it is based on the moral law. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself my remaining 30 seconds to refresh the minds of the members that the gentleman from Indiana will move the previous question. I would request a yay and nay vote. A yay vote for the previous question will send this bill to the White House. A nay vote, if carried, will vote down the previous question. The question was taken. Yays, 229. Nays, 195. Not voting, nine. Senate's final vote with amendments was 71 to 20, with five members voting present or abstaining. Now the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, Demetria L. McCain. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. All right. A man was denied housing by an owner of a property because he was the father of young children. A black woman was denied housing, a rental unit, by an owner who discriminated against her, who then 
took out a discriminatory ad in Craigslist. And when she complained about the discrimination, he retaliated against her. A very large group of persons with disabilities who are living in public housing went long, long, long periods of time not getting their reasonable accommodations met because the housing authority failed to properly monitor its subrecipient partner. A man went against his own tenant because the owner, this was, this was actually an RV resort, because the owner said, hey, tenant, you need to dress like a man, act like a man, carry yourself like a man. Sex discrimination based on gender identity. These are just four of the examples of the thousands of complaints with which the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity has to wrestle with. This is just four. So just imagine, imagine the type of harm and hurt people are experiencing because of the housing discrimination that persists in our country. But it is because of the Fair Housing Act, the Fair Housing Act that was pushed by advocates, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and others and we sit here today in an auditorium called the Brooke Mondale Auditorium after the architects of that fair housing bill. So we've just got to reflect on some of that history, right? That history is real today. And so to the extent that this act was adopted, thousands of people have had a place to go to complain about their harms, to try to seek relief, relief for themselves, and public relief for others as well, who were not necessarily complainants. So I just want to take this time right now to thank each and every one of you. If you are part of FHEO, please stand up. These are the folks who work day in and day out. They have a number of roles that they play in FHEO. And keep standing, if you are a part of HUD, and if you, if you have done anything at all, keep standing, if you have done anything at all to help somebody with their fair housing problem, even if it meant referring them to FHEO, please stand up. And if you're visiting our building today and you're a fair housing partner of ours and you've helped anybody whatsoever in any form or fashion with their fair housing problem, please stand up. We thank our guests for being here today. Thank you. You can be seated now. And I also want to draw your attention to the president's statement today recognizing the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. I invite you to go to, uh, to the White House's website to read that. Um, it's very poignant. I also want to shout out a few people real quickly, and I usually get in trouble when I do this, but specifically um, from the FHEO team, I want to shout out the Office of Policy, Legislative Initiatives, and Outreach, particularly our education and outreach team, who put all of this together and have been working so very hard over these last months. And I want to thank our broadcast team, who've worked hand in hand with us. And you'll see more of their handiwork later. You saw a little bit of it. And thank you to the TSU debate team. TSU is also a recipient of a HUD research grant, so they're a good partner of ours here at HUD. Also, I want to thank Office of Public Affairs. Where are you? Office of Public Affairs. Thank you very much for everything you're doing and everything you're going to do, because like Black History Month, Fair Housing Month is year-round. Right? Um, I also want to thank the Office of, of Policy Development and Research, Eric Erickson. You saw some of the, um, the, the archival footage. If you didn't know, we do have a library. We have a HUD library upstairs, so make sure you take advantage of that. Thank you to our regional and our field staff who are watching virtually. Um, I also want to thank all of the sign interpreters. I think we have two of them here today. Thank you for making sure that this presentation is able to be experienced by absolutely everyone. But now let me take a step back, because beyond the Fair Housing Act directive to not discriminate, We've got what's called Title 42 of the U.S. Code, 
section 3608D, to be precise. So let's get into the text. Quote, all executive departments and agencies shall administer their programs and activities relating to housing and urban development, including any federal agency having regulatory or supervisory authority over financial institutions in a manner affirmatively to further the purposes of this subchapter and, and shall cooperate with the secretary to further such purpose." Close quote. Now, as you may know, at the direction of President Biden, HUD published a notice of, pu of proposed rulemaking, as was mentioned by our great Secretary Fudge, called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. Now, the proposed rule, once finalized, would implement the Fair Housing Act statutory mandate, statutory from 1968, right? to affirmably further fair housing, which requires HUD, that will be us, and its program participants, that will be all of you out there, <laughs> to proactively, proactively take meaningful actions to overcome the patterns of segregation, promote fair housing choice, eliminate disparities and opportunities, and foster inclusive communities that are free from discrimination. Additionally, additionally, as Secretary mentioned, HUD recently published a final rule, the Discriminatory Effects Rule, restoring the 2013 version and ensuring alignment with the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Alignment in a way that is actually consistent with the way the courts have actually interpreted this for 50, over 50 years, over 50 years, and actually in a way that more effectively implements the broad remedial purposes of Fair housing, right? So in order to do this, we've got to make sure we're paying attention to unnecessary discriminatory practices that the housing market might be carrying out, right? See, fair housing prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, or financing of dwellings and in other related activities related to housing. And this particular prohibition I'm talking about it extends to practices that simply are unjustified, unjustified discriminatory effects, regardless of whether it was there, is, there was intent or not. Now, my friends, my friends, it is high time that we bring all the tools to the fair housing front. That includes comprehensive compliance with and enforcement of the Fair Housing Act's duty to affirmably further fair housing. It is a duty that goes beyond refraining from discrimination. It is high time that we bring all the tools to the fair housing front. Bring all the tools so that there may be the elimination of housing discrimination. And when we do, when we do, see if affordable, safe homes in areas where people want to live and thrive will not open up. When we do, see if neighborhoods that are resource abundant, no matter the zip code, will be found throughout our towns, our cities, our counties, and throughout our states. And then, and then, then may we find streets overflowing with children frolicking in the street having a good time and playing. Then, then and only then, may we find a racial wealth gap that has actually narrowed. Then, my friends, may we find elders aging in place, places that accommodate the challenges experienced when one is growing older. Then may we find welcoming landlords who rent to tenants no matter whom they love. Then may we find neighborhoods that no longer segregate, based on national origin or religion. Then may we find state and local resources equitably utilized. Then may we find appropriate amounts of accessible design and construction on the front end before development. Then may we find persons convicting of check fraud 15 years ago able to access federal supportive housing resources. And then, 
may we find individuals in public housing who no longer are sexually harassed by their landlords. Let each and every one of us here and watching online, let each and every one of us bring all the tools to the fair housing front. And then if we do, if we do, if we do, we can actually see a pouring down in every nook and cranny of housing, of people thriving, and in a country that truly gets what fair housing is all about. So thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of our program. Thank you, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary McCain for your dedication and commitment to fair housing as well as your remarks for today. Next, we welcome a video from Ambassador Susan Rice, Director of the United States Domestic Policy Council, who sends a message from the White House. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here alongside Secretary Fudge, a true champion for fair housing, and Lee Porter, known as the mother of fair housing. This is not just an opportunity to reflect on the past, the passage of the Fair Housing Act 55 years ago. It's a call to action to ensure that we fulfill its promise for generations to come. The Fair Housing Act codified our commitment to ensuring that everybody is protected from housing discrimination. Unfortunately, the discrimination that Mrs. Porter experienced in 1965 is something that persists to this day for far too many Americans. That's why, in President Biden's first days in office, he demonstrated his commitment to fair housing, calling on federal agencies to fully enforce the Fair Housing Act. During the pandemic, the White House worked closely with the Departments of Treasury and Housing and Urban Development to ensure that the eviction crisis did not have a disproportionate impact on households of color. State, local, and tribal governments made almost 11 million emergency rental assistance payments, 46% of which have gone to black households and 29% to Latino households. Furthermore, on the anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, the 100th anniversary, the Domestic Policy Council and the Department of Housing and Urban Development launched our PAVE Task Force to address racial bias in home appraisals. Last year, we released an action plan with more than 20 initiatives to counter racial bias in the appraisal industry. The White House also established the blueprint for a renter's bill of rights. We're working with agencies to raise awareness of and strengthen enforcement against algorithmic bias, which has a negative impact on background checks and screening reports, particularly for Asian, Black, and Latino renters. And we're exploring ways to address source of income discrimination, which limits housing options for those who receive rental assistance. The President and I are committed to pursuing this work with our federal partners and all of you here today. Let's make fair housing a reality for all. Thank you for your critical work to advance fair housing. I look forward to our ongoing partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rice. Now we will share an interview between FHEO's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Demetria L. McCain, and the mother of fair housing, Ms. Lee Porter, with a special introduction from Senator Cory Booker. Hello, everyone gathered together to celebrate Fair Housing Month, commemorating the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to just celebrate this, but also to say a few words about one of my greatest life heroes, Lee Porter. Lee Porter has been a New Jersey icon for decades, helping people and families overcome discrimination and prejudice to get them what is this ideal of America. We end our, pledge, uh, our national anthem with those words the home of the brave. Well, we have homes because of brave people like Lee Porter. 
you understand that that is what it means to be an American. What she fights for is in the very words of our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We start with this idea of equality. And when it comes to housing, equal access to fair housing is got to be a fundamental part of the American dream. This is self-evident, but it is not automatic. It takes champions. It takes people that will dedicate themselves to the ideals and principles of our nation to make them real for everyone. Because if the American dream isn't real for everyone, it's not real for anyone. And that is why one of the greatest patriots I know is Lee Porter, humble hero who did for my family when my mom and dad were moving from this city, Washington, D.C., up to my home state of New Jersey, they were turned away from housing over and over again, and then they turned to the Fair Housing Council and found Lee Porter. One might say, without um, any kind of doubt, that had it not been for her intervention in my family's life, when I was just a baby, I might not be here as a United States Senator today. Lee Porter, I love you. I am inspired by you. You are a shining example of patriotism and you are a dedicated foot soldier for the highest ideals of our nation, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone. Sending love to you all as you celebrate this important milestone and rededicate yourself to the work still to do. We are in Bergen County, New Jersey, where we are about to meet and speak with the mother of fair housing, Miss Lee Porter. We've got the FHL team, we've got the broadcast team, and we're all super excited. I understand that she is just full of stories. So hang on to your seats, log in, sit back, and let's see what she has to say. Thank you so much. We are actually here with Mrs. Lee Porter, the mother of fair housing. And I just want to say personally, thank you for taking this time. And let me tell you, our whole staff at the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, they are thrilled to be able to have this opportunity with you. So thank you. And thank you for letting us come into your office. <laughs> so let's just dig right in, if that's okay with you, Ms. Porter. Sure. Take me back to where you grew up. When we left uh, Brooklyn, and after we left there, we came to New Jersey. I never got back to Brooklyn to live. Did you miss it? A little bit, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like people say, when you leave, leave New York, you ain't going nowhere. But <laughs> <laughs> Now, take me back, though, to uh, your search when you were looking for housing by yourself. What was that like? They kept showing us, no, no matter which agent you used, they show you the same houses over and over again, and not the ones that were in the newspapers. I said, I want to see this house in Ridgewood. I want to see this. They didn't show it, or if you, they showed it, you couldn't buy it. I couldn't see everything that was advertised in the newspapers. And when the black brokers continued to show me the same house over and over again, I said, no, I saw this. I want to see something else. A friend referred me to uh, this little committee, which is a fair housing committee. And when they took me out in one day, I purchased a house, which I something I couldn't do over three, four months. Certainly, so that help was tremendous. Yes, so I stayed with the Fair Housing Group and we grew. Take me a little bit to <clears throat> the change from being a volunteer to doing this professionally, because right now you're the executive director of the Fair Housing Council of Northern New Jersey. When I got to Bergen County, I did volunteer with the um, League of Women Voters, the Fair Housing Council, Okay. And, um, and a few other organizations that I did enjoy working with. That's great. Now, what did you make of the actual enactment of the Fair Housing Act of 1968? We still had a long way to go because uh, the discrimination continued. The assistance now, it's with HUD and uh, your staff. <laughs> we don't know what we'd do without them. And then <laughs> we you. have local assistance as well. 
And then the money. Tell me more about that. The money was very important. We were able to be funded. We were able to, um, uh, to hire people and retain them. Now, I, I'm told by my um, colleague, Aztec Jacobs, whom you know. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> that there was an organization called, is it the National Committee? Help me out here. NCDH, yes. Okay, and NCDH stood for? National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing. Now tell me about that group. Oh, that was your group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a part of your group. Uh, the HUD would give um, NCDH uh, $4 million a year to spread around the country to the fair housing groups or people doing housing. It wasn't enough for all of us when you look at housing coast to coast. We wanted NCDH to um, apply for more money, receive more money, so that people like us could be funded. Especially at a time when we were going into court mostly with volunteer attorneys and we won a case. The judge gave us everything we wanted, but we didn't have enough money to fulfill all of the uh, requests, the obligations that we had. So we had to turn to HUD. We felt it was HUD's responsibility. You, you hear it mentioned FIP now. Yes. It was mentioned direct funding straight from HUD to the fair housing groups, no middleman. We wanted direct funding from you. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, from HUD, from the government. <laughs> from the sovereign. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the birth of the FIPS. Yes, they did. They funded it. At the Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing Equal Opportunity was a veteran. Uh, he was a commander. He understood discrimination. So, Ms. Porter, I mean, you've been fighting on the front line for so long, but you were doing that as a female. Yes. Did the issue of your gender, beyond being black, obviously, did the issue of your gender ever come up throughout these years? All the time. Um, and I, I will say this is Women's History Month right now. <laughs> too proud to let them see me crying. So I didn't cry in, really until I got on the train or the plane, gender uh, and getting home on time. On time for what? Uh, on time, to, well I couldn't feed the children because it was already late. But at so least you were doing same, all of this as a mother and a wife? That's what women, it wasn't just me, it was all the women. Okay. They only, most of them thought of women as stay home and have babies and that's it. That's all you're good for. Mm -hmm. But times did change. Speaking of times changing, so we are now just a little bit away from the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Does it seem that long? It doesn't seem that long to you. <laughs>
discrimination and unfair treatment of minorities, mostly minorities of color. We won the suit. 300, did you say? That's, that was their membership at the time. Wow. And we won. The judge gave us everything we asked for. What'd you ask for? Equality, uh, list your vacancies with us. Let us know when minorities visit your office because we would ask them questions about how they were treated, where they were shown. They gave us everything we asked for, all the chores, all of the um, activities that we wanted. But as a group, we didn't have enough money to fulfill to what we to, asked for. To carry out some of the administrative aspects of yes. that. Wow. Okay. That's when we went to HUD. And we didn't want the HUD people to think that uh, we were taking over their jobs. Because that was the feeling all over the fifth floor and the, I think the tenth floor as well. Mm -hmm. We worked with the churches. We worked with the uh, social organizations. We worked with the, um, we loved Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and League of Women Voters because they helped us quite a bit in this part of the country. Now tell me a little bit more about these partnerships with other groups. So what kind of role would a church or a Boy Scout group play? Most of the churches would, ho we, didn't have a, we didn't have an office. So each month the uh, Fair Housing Group met at a different church mm -hmm. or anyone who would take us in. So really kind of getting to that younger generation mm -hmm. at the outset. Right. That's and great. the adults too. That's great. Uh, we had to work with the um, adults in scouting, not only the ones who were Girl Scout leaders, but the, um, the mothers. The parents. Yeah, all the parents. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> now, you, say, you said that you guys were you know, using space and office spaces in these churches and what have you. But right now, you have your very own office. <laughs> You've grown. Um, so I think some of your advocacy worked, might you say. <laughs> Now, tell me though, now, today, what would you say is, if there is a trend, is there a trend in the types of cases that you're seeing today, here in 2023? Uh, race is still very important. It's number one in, in a way. But now it is disability as well. Is looking at um, uh, uh, persons being discriminated against because they have a service animal, because uh, uh, they might be blind or uh, sick in some way or another. We like to make sure that it's a, really a, dis um, um, a disability case, and we'll take it. And um, if we can't handle it ourselves, we give it to you. <laughs> Why, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Knowing what you know now, what would you say to your younger self who's maybe just starting your career in fair housing? Uh, work with the people who are willing to work with you. Persevere and do what you know you think will work. Work with the churches, all the religions, all of the agencies, because fair housing is fair living in a way. That is great to hear. Fair housing is fair mm. living. I really like that. What do you think the biggest thing is that we need to address to try to alleviate housing discrimination? Because it hasn't gone away yet. Yeah. <clears throat> I think continue with what we are doing, more housing, affordable housing. So it's not just HUD's job, <laughs> it's the job of the total government. Do more in the way of education, and yes, yeah, some action too. But if we had more Lee Porters. <laughs> <laughs> Any last words that you'd want to share? We're very grateful to HUD uh, for even listening to us. I used to spend, um, whenever I had a problem, I felt I could walk into HUD and talk to the whoever was in charge of whatever complaint I was making. They would sit down and listen. Well, I have to tell you that working under Secretary Marsha L. Fudge, which is a real delight, um, she truly believes in the fact that we need to listen to people because people understand what they're oh, going yes. through. And she wants to make sure that people know that we are listening and we do care. So it's beautiful to hear you say that. So I appreciate that. But I got to say one more time, I got to quote you now that fair housing is fair living.
Thank you, Ms. Porter. Thank you. Have a great one. Now we will have closing remarks from Nathan Roth, advisor to the National Fair Housing Training Academy and special assistant in the Office of Enforcement in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. We have a special guest here. <laughs> First, let's just give a hand to our moderator today. Come forward. She filled in for somebody, and I think she did an excellent job. So thank you very much. Thank I'm you. embarrassing her. <laughs> thank you. And thank you uh, to front office staff, Lucia, Myth, uh, uh, Chang, and, and, and the broadcast team, and, and our racial equity senior advisor who helped procure the video from Senator, Senator Cory Booker. We want to send a thank out. thanks out for that as well. And now, Nathan Roth. Thank you so much. So we're, we're going to keep the thanks going. Uh, thank you, Tiffany, uh, for emceeing the Fair Housing Month opening ceremony. And thank you to the Texas Southern University debate team and the United States Air Force Honor Guard Colors team for their performance today. Let's give them another round of applause. So what a remarkable commemoration of the 55th anniversary of the signing of the federal fair housing act this isn't on the script but i'll say quickly who put me up after lee porter secretary <laughs> fudge etc come on down whether you're joining us live in person or virtually or whether you're watching a recording of this event thank you for being part of this moment and movement we hope you're as energized and hopeful about the future of fair housing opportunities in this nation as we are. Today we've heard from key fair housing leaders about the past, present, and future of fair housing. Thank you, Secretary Fudge, for your unwavering commitment to ensuring that fair housing is unquestionably front and center in all that HUD and its partners do every day. It is said that fair housing is the heart of HUD, and Secretary Fudge, you're an example to generations of children who grow up in Ohio or anywhere else, that one day they too can lead as a cabinet level secretary, ensuring that our collective fair housing heart beats healthy. Your leadership in restoring fair housing regulations and policies no doubt restores our world in time. And thanks too to Ambassador Rice for your remarks on the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to advancing equity in housing. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Dimitri McCain, thanks too for your leadership uh, and commitment to advancing fair housing and for the ways that you inspire HUD to lead by listening to the people we serve, including a new generation of residents who are positioned to ensure choice and lift every voice. And of course, last but not least, uh, we just saw uh, the mother of fair housing, Lee Porter, Thank you for sharing your trailblazing experiences with us and for your continued dedication to the ideal that, as you said, fair housing is fair living for us all. Your leadership, actions, and deeds demonstrate that a mother from New Jersey can see housing injustice and do something about it, dedicating the entirety of your life uh, to bending the moral arc toward justice for generations to come. So, if you're like me, you're sitting back and you're thinking, well, I'm not one of those trailblazers. What can I do to ensure fair housing choices for all voices? The good news is that we all have a role to play. Advancing fair housing requires each of us to take meaningful actions, as Demetria said earlier, in our neighborhoods, our communities, businesses, and other spheres of influence. So ask yourself, whether you're in the room today or you're watching virtually, what are my gifts that I'll bring to this movement? Who is the one person on your block or in your community who you might lift up to empower to become a first time home buyer? As it's been said, this can lead to generational wealth building opportunities that home ownership brings. Fair housing takes collaboration. So what one business, nonprofit, or fair housing group will you build a partnership with today or in the future 
to eradicate housing discrimination. And when someone believes that they have been the victim of housing discrimination, how will you help them seek justice? While all of us may certainly take many actions, it's when each of us does something that the ripples on the ocean turn into a wave of needed opportunity for all. And HUD and its partners have prepared resources for you to get started in that endeavor. We invite you to visit, as it's been said earlier, HUD, H-U-D dot G-O-V forward slash F-H-M to learn about fair housing activities, educational opportunities, and outreach resources. On April 19th, HUD's National Fair Housing Training Academy will offer a national forum titled Choices for All Voices, Innovative Education and Outreach to Build an Equitable Future. The forum will prepare you to empower the public around the fair housing rights and responsibilities that exist, and you'll walk away with key education and outreach and customer experience best practices from experts in the field. And on April 26th, HUD will hold a national event titled Building an Equitable Future, a housing policy conversation with Gen Z college students. The conversation between the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing, Demetria McCain, and college students will explore housing policy and, import, and the importance of securing fair housing protections for the new generation of housing consumers. The website uh, also showcases, and again, that's hud.gov forward slash FHM, FHM uh, HUD initiatives, as well as key training resources, including table talks, uh, the newly launched LGBTQIA plus fair housing toolkit, and information on how to file a fair housing complaint. We also encourage you to visit FHEO's new website, which is just recently redesigned, and to stay in touch on Facebook and Twitter channels. So, as we close this Fair Housing Month opening ceremony, we give thanks to you, our partners, and to the people we serve. The gifts that you bring to this movement for the ways that uh, you will ensure choices for all voices. And we wish you a very meaningful and purposed Fair Housing Month. Thank you.